what I'd like to do is just uh, give you a couple of uh, updates on what we're doing in terms of uh, activities. Tomorrow, I'm headed down to AOSH, A-A-O-S-H, American Academy of Oral Systemic Health Professionals. It's, uh, it's going to be a group of about three to 500 individuals. Most of them are uh, dentists and their staff, um, folks that are very much in touch with the fact that having periodontal disease is a risk factor for um, cardiovascular inflammation and therefore for heart attack and stroke. There, there will also be a, a large group of uh, docs there as well, docs that are into um, uh, prevention and um, uh, functional medicine docs. So looking forward to seeing that crowd. I've already had several of them uh, acknowledge uh, our email and uh, let me know they would be there. The, uh, we are, uh, we have good attendance for the upcoming Louisville event. Uh, that's in two weeks. Um, and we have, uh, I think we're, we're beyond the, uh, the sale component, you know, the first 10 for the webinar series. Again, I'll talk a little bit more about the webinar series here and actually provide you some of the information from the webinar series. Um, I was talking with a, uh, a lady last week and asked her about it. She and her husband were interested in getting a CIMT. Um, I asked, well, do you know if you have uh, inflammation or do you know if you have insulin resistance? She said, well, he does. We don't know if I do. And I said, well, why do you not uh, join the, the webinar? You can get the testing there. That's what it's for. And she said, well, the webinar we're not really sure why we'd want to do the webinar. We get so much free information from you on the channel. <laughs> and I said, I know, I've had this conversation with multiple people. We've, been, we've not been very clear about what the webinar is. Uh, the folks that have figured it out, though, have acknowledged and understand it's a, it's a great um, way to get testing. So what we're doing is we're, here's the history on it. Um, well, let me just say this. What we're doing is we're offering the cardiovascular inflammation test, the panel through Quest, through our relationship with Quest, because uh, we have found out that they're no longer offering it um, direct to patients. In addition, while we're offering that, we're also offering testing for uh, the most common cause of inflammation, which we all know is insulin resistance. So uh, most of our docs don't know uh, to dig any deeper than a hemoglobin A1C or perhaps a uh, fasting blood glucose, but there's so much more that you can do. Um, OGTT, oral glucose tolerance test, where you fast for eight hours, take a blood sugar, drink, uh, drink some blood sugar, then take another blood sugar test uh, one hour later and two hours later. We also, in addition to that, add insulin uh, testing at zero, fasting, one hour and two hours. And that gives us a lot of very, very interesting information. For example, uh, we get a lot of people that have uh, fairly normal um, uh, hemoglobin A1Cs, but they have uh, out of normal OGTTs. We actually, now that we're able to get insulin values, we actually get um, about one, once per month, we'll get somebody who's got a normal OGTT, but their insulin values are, are out of whack, sometimes taking twice as much insulin to keep that blood sugar uh, in a good space. So bottom line is uh, sometimes it's okay to guess, but when you're worried about whether or not, when you don't know if you have cardiovascular inflammation or not, or insulin resistance, don't guess, go ahead and test. So, um, <clears throat> We've taught thousands of people how to get this. Quest stopped uh, offering the CV inflammation panel to the customer, and that's what we're doing. We're working to help. As we've, uh, we've discussed in the past, inflammation is a big, big deal. I mean, it's something that was listed on the cover of Time Magazine, uh, the surprising link between inflammation, heart attacks, cancer, Alzheimer's, and other disease, and what you can do to fight it. If you look at this, um, this next image, cardiology in, uh, interventions, inflammation for the cardiologists. The standards committees of medicine still understand very clearly that inflammation is a big deal, including inflammation for the cardiologists. But here we are 
in 2019, and we don't have really good uh, guidance in that space. You know, you want to know when that um, Time Magazine article was? 2004. So we've been diddling with this for about 15 years. I personally would have decided not to wait for the standards committees. I know they're probably going to get around to where they need to be in a good place, but uh, they're not there yet. So I'm getting cardiovascular inflammation testing in the in that panel that we're talking about, and I'm offering it to patients. And again, we're offering it to folks in the um, in the webinar series. Just as a clarification on the two things that we're talking about. Um, first of all, we'll we'll start at the heart and lung. I mean, the heart and uh, large artery areas. Then we'll go down a little bit deeper to two areas, two layers: the intima and the media. It gets a lot more complicated than that. Uh, but we're going to skip these extra layers and we'll talk a little bit about what's called the glycocalyx. This is a couple of different, Im three different images of it. The one in the top right here is an actual picture from a cross section of a, an art a tiny arterial and or capillary where you see these hairy appendages coming out. That is the glycocalyx. The uh, purple image here is a, um, is a diagram of it. And this picture below is, an, again, another uh, actual picture. C over here is an injured um, glycocalyx. So let's go take a quick look at that. Before we do, let's just take a quick digression. Um, one of the things we worry about with, um, with this process, inflammation and in, in, uh, insulin resistance, it's something like uh, diabetic retinopathy. And you may say, well, Ford, you're getting ahead of yourself. And um, I would say no. Uh, as, uh, as we've talked, as we've discussed many times, the School of Public Health in uh, at UCLA has demonstrated that half of, of adults 30 years and older have insulin resistance or full-blown diabetes. The point that I'm going to make here in this next slide is that even diabetic retinopathy is not just a disease that happens after your diagnosis of full-blown disease. There have been multiple studies which look at this issue, and here's the point. Retinopathy is defined by microaneurysms or worse lesions in at least one eye was present in 39% of men and 35% 30, uh, of women at the time of diagnosis of type two diabetes. So let me go back and connect a couple of dots here. You're saying, well, you know, I don't know if I've got insulin resistance or not. Uh, again, half of adults, a third to a half of adults have insulin resistance. And you're saying, well, maybe that's not a problem. And I'm saying, hmm. We clearly know that that creates plaque, it burns your glycocalyx, it sets you up for inflammation and therefore risk for heart attack and stroke. And if you're still not quite believing that, it, that having insulin resistance is damaging, if you're like that guy, I can't remember his name, the, uh, the author of the article saying that insulin resistance or prediabetes was a dubious diagnosis, he obviously was, not, a, not aware of the science. You get injury to your body when you have insulin resistance. So wanted to give a, a couple of examples of the testing that we're talking about. This is my inflammation panel from, I don't see the, oh, uh, 219, 2015. I've, ha I've had some since then. Uh, but that was the uh, that was the image that I had available. I wanted to just show show this. One of the problems that we have with Quest is that even though Quest is a national lab, they will uh, give us different formats. This is the simplest, easiest, only time I've ever gotten all of the inflammation panel in one section on the report. The inflammation panel includes myeloperoxidase. LP, PLA2 act, uh, activity, high sensitivity CRP, C-reactive protein, and microalbumin creatinine ratio. Again, very briefly, the first two are actual enzymes released by our immune system when our immune system is attacking plaque 
in our arteries, artery walls. CRP is a protein made by the liver in reaction to um, uh, in reaction to inflammation, and the microalbumin creatinine uh, ratio is an actual measurement of how much protein the intima is letting through uh, uh, is letting pass through. So here's the thing: if that glycocalyx is injured. Um, then the intima is injured and it's likely to let uh, protein through the filter in the kidney into the urine. So those are the brief and maybe overly quick uh, summaries of the type of information we're looking at with uh, the inflammation panel. Why don't we just look at one thing? A lot of people that do look at cardiovascular inflammation do look at one thing and they look just at C-reactive protein. Here's the reason, quick example, way too many false positives with just C-reactive protein alone. If I were to, um, to give 100 people a flu shot today, about two thirds of them would have a positive C-reactive protein two days from now. So again, that's the reason we don't just look at one number, one lab. A Couple of other um, quick examples. This individual, for example, has a, a very good, very desirable, I'm jealous. OGTT, a, uh, a fasting specimen uh, glucose in the 80s, the one hour specimen at 114, the two hour specimen back down to 72. Again, mine would not, mine doesn't come out that way. Here's a, uh, another example. This is an individual that was very, very sharp, or is very sharp individual in terms of well, what's going on here and said to me, my blood sugar is fine. My doc checks it every year and I check up on him. Dr. Brewer, I know you focus on this. I will humor you and go ahead and get. Um, this is a uh, version of a, of a um, Kraft insulin survey. So here's what we see with the Kraft insulin survey for this individual who was uh, told he had no uh, blood sugar problems and knew that himself. Fasting came out in the 80s, which was good. One half hour all the way up over uh, 2012. At one hour, it continued to climb to 257, two hours at 291, three hours back, finally back down to 168. And again, that's why I say don't guess, test. And uh, for sure, the um, just relying on hemoglobin A1C and fasting blood sugar is a guess. As you see in this individual, uh, for Insulin values corresponding to these at uh, fasting, we want them to be below five. His was good there. Uh, you don't want them to have to go over 50 for optimum uh, blood sugar management. And you want them to get back to uh, less, uh, 10 or less uh, at hour two. It, obviously this individual was struggling uh, or his pancreas was struggling to uh, keep up with that challenge. This just gives uh, those of you who remember the video, that was a popular video, it's where I covered the different patterns that you see on a Kraft uh, insulin survey in terms of, um, of insulin and blood sugar. <clears throat> here's the thing, here's a normal one, uh, the uh, starting at 80, peaking at about 120 and then coming down within a couple of hours. Insulin starting below five, peaking up, and this one peaked at 80, optimum would be 50 or less, and then going back down. Pattern two, you get some delayed response. Um, pattern three, you get further delayed response, or 3A. Pattern 3B, further delay. Pattern four, you see the blood sugars are getting up around 250, and insulin values are getting up around 250 as well. Pattern five is the one that helps click for a lot of folks. And that's where if somebody's got full-blown diabetes, they've, um, they're just, their body's not producing insulin anymore at that point. Gonna cover a couple of other um, points. I get, those of you who've, uh, who keep up with the comments on the channel know that every, every few weeks we'll get somebody that says, yeah, I got the uh, OGTT or the insulin survey and I'm not only insulin resistant, pre-diabetic, I have full-blown diabetes. And why on earth does my doc not know that? Well, here's a national survey of primary care physicians' knowledge, practices, and perceptions on pre-diabetes. Bottom line is, um, uh, docs, what, I think one of the comments they made was that 
um, less than 30, okay, only 36% of PCPs refer patients to a diabetes prevention uh, lifestyle change. And uh, here's the thing, if you think that the, the, those physicians are actually doing a full-blown lifestyle coaching with those patients, oh, wake up. No, they're not. Uh, the average uh, visit for um, primary care is about seven minutes, so you can't do lifestyle management in that time period. The, um, that survey went on to ask the docs, well, what do you think the problem is? And the docs basically said, look, the patients aren't motivated to make these lifestyle changes, uh, so I don't go there. Now, before we beat up on the docs, there's a lot of truth to that. A lot of your docs will typically come out of training, be very aggressive with uh, helping train patients, educate patients in terms of managing their lifestyle. After a few hundred patients saying, yeah, I, or yeah, I still don't want to do it, you sort of uh, wear out on that issue. So this is not just a doctor issue, but it ends up becoming a... Uh, a systems issue. It's the doc, it's the systems. Um, the insurance companies don't pay for spending that kind of time with patients. And sure enough, it's the patients as well. So it's easy to blame it on the docs. Uh, it's easy to blame it on the insurance company. It's easy to blame on the, on the other two, if, uh, no, depending on which one you are. Bottom line is this is important information and we need to, uh, again, get started uh, looking at this. This is uh, another version of, uh, of the uh, inflammation panel. This shows uh, something to be aware of. This is a, uh, a male's um, inflammation. The lab test itself says that they were normal because microbiome creatinine was less than 30. The lab test uh, normals themselves are really looking for kidney disease. Microalbuminuria is what we're looking for. Anything above uh, six to eight for a male, microalbumin creatinine ratio is um, risk for cardiovascular disease. I'm just gonna uh, click through a couple of others uh, and then we'll uh, back out and start taking some questions. This is what you want to happen. This is the patient progress. Pardon the, uh, the blurring on this image. It was there, I couldn't fix it. But this is somebody who was having some problems. As you can see, had two and three um, positive uh, problems with cardiovascular inflammation. He saw this, he started working on it with me, started working on his lifestyle. Uh, and in most cases, it involves losing some weight. Um, and as you see now, his current numbers, he's got that inflammation down. So I'm gonna go back in show, uh, go back out and see what we have in terms of questions and comments. And I'm gonna move that over there so we, okay. Rob T07, good morning, Doc. Good world, hello. Uh, and if you guys could go ahead and start hitting me with some of the comments and questions that you may have. C. Lear, good morning. First time I've been able to catch you live. What does it mean if insulin number one is 9.5? Um, uh, the standards would say, well, that insulin of 9.5 on fasting is a good number. I would tell you it's not optimum. It's an acceptable number, but it's not optimum. You want your uh, fasting insulin to be uh, less than five. 147 degrees west, good morning. Sun is not up yet in Alaska. That's what I was thinking. You're there in Alaska. Uh, it is 1124 our time. You're probably what, five time zones away. Thanks for joining. We, uh, we're happy to see you here. Peggy Johnson, what about stevia and erythritol? Because that's how I eat any sweets. I eat them every day. Okay, so that's a great question. And let me just take a few minutes and talk about the non-nutritive sweetener story. Back 30 years ago, the, about the only thing that was available was saccharin. There, were, uh, there was a huge scare about saccharin causing cancer, specifically um, bladder cancer, um, because it happened in mice. The, um, even 30 years ago, there were those of us who looked at that and said, hmm, you really don't have a significant record of increased risk of um, 
of bladder cancer in humans with saccharin. And you go back and you look at the, the mouse data, the lab, uh, the lab mouse data, and they were basically given the, um, the mouse <clears throat> what an equivalent to, uh, to the human would be, would be about a uh, pickup truck full of saccharin every day. <clears throat> so we still don't know the answer in terms of humans. If we, gave, if we had any human that actually took a pickup truck full of saccharin every day, um, it may cause can bladder cancer for that human. I just, I don't expect that that study's gonna be done anytime soon. Um, but let's go to another view of this. Um, there's clearly evidence that non-nutritive sweeteners do impact the gut biome. There's been, I reported on that a couple of years ago. Um, it was some research that came out of uh, Israel. And the gut biome is very, very important. Uh, they've done studies which demonstrate, look, if you, if you transfer the gut biome of someone that has insulin resistance or di diabetes to lab animals and even to, uh, to other humans, it's, it's been shown, you will greatly increase that, uh, the recipient uh, risk of developing insulin resistance and or diabetes. So there is something to the gut biome and insulin resistance or, or diabetes, as well as there is uh, to many other health determinants. Now, <clears throat> uh, one other side to this non-nutritive sweetener, uh, third, that uh, saccharin was 30 years ago. Now you've got a ton of things. Um, just an update, I will tell you that there's been significant uh, research indicating challenges with, um, with all of the non-nutritive sweeteners that I'm aware of, at least in terms of gut biome issues, um, that's obviously not as hard a, a, uh, an outcome as full-blown cancer, um, but you still do see that. You haven't seen them, or at least I haven't seen them in terms of the science, any significant evidence that, you're um, that you get that from stevia. So here's my personal read on it. I do use stevia uh, and I'm not concerned at all about stevia. I'm more concerned about any of the others. Um, the, the yellow packets, the pink packets, which are saccharin, the um, several of, of the others. Now, things like monk fruit actually have sugar in them. Uh, erythritol, is a is actually a pretty good one. Um, it's expensive and you don't and for that reason you don't see it used a lot. A couple of other points about the non-nutritive sweetener. I've been a uh, non-nutritive sweetener addict for a major part of my life. I've gotten sick of it. One of the things I've started doing is um, is putting um, Jim Nima. Jim Nima in my uh, morning coffee. Um, I've got videos and what else I put in my morning coffee, but Jim Nima is known, it's an old, it's an ancient Ayurvedic uh, medicine known as the sugar killer. And what it actually does is it, it coats the uh, sugar taste receptors in the back of your tongue and palate. So you, it's true I, and I, I, you can tell it by uh, drinking or putting some Jim Nima in your mouth. Then you go try to, to uh, ingest something sweet, whether it's a non-nutritive sweetener or sugar, and it just doesn't taste the same. I've had a, out of my whole life, I've tried multiple times to decrease um, my uh, non-nutritive sweetener addiction. I'm making significant progress now with uh, good old fashioned 3000 year old Jim Nima, or maybe it's a thousand years old, but it's a very old um, intervention. Let me just say one last thing about uh, non-nutritive sweeteners before we move on. You'll see a lot of uh, research about out that says, oh, you gain weight with non nutritive sweeteners, you get diabetes with non-nutritive sweeteners, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, those are, are 
uh, environmental studies, meaning you look at uh, people that are using it and you take uh, people that are using non-nutritive sweeteners and then you look to see how, how many people in each population, users and non-users have uh, diabetes or obesity. Or you can do it the other way and look at people that have diabetes or obesity versus controls and then look at um, non-nutritive sweetener use. Clearly, guess what you're gonna see? You're gonna see non-nutritive sweetener use linked with people that have diabetes or insulin because they don't wanna take sugar and with people that are obese because they're trying to cut back on their calorie intake. Um, let's go back. So you're always gonna see that in the science. When you do see that on a specific study, look for that bias because that is a study bias. That really doesn't mean anything in terms of the non-nutritive sweeteners themselves. Final point on non-nutritive sweeteners, and I'll move on. Um, look at the diabetic population. Look at uh, Richard K. Bernstein. He's uh, the godfather of diabetic self-care. He still uses uh, non-nutritive sweeteners a lot, recommends them. And despite having full-blown, very brittle diabetes in his 30s um, and using non-nutritive sweeteners uh, up through his 80s, he did not have a problem. And all he did all his life was manage other diabetics and um, did not see problems with um, non-nutritive sweeteners. So yes, there's some soft signals that non-nutritive sweeteners are a problem. They're very soft. And even those soft signals, and they have to do with, again, gut biome kind of stuff. They don't have to do with uh, diabetes. The, the signals I've seen in the, uh, in the search regarding diabetes and obesity, again, very, uh, very unclear, uh, not, not something I would worry about at all because of the bias issue. Um, overall, it can't be good to be taking a chemical in. So I'm trying to, I continue to try to work on my, non, my own non-nutritive sweetener um, addiction. Okay, so Peggy Johnson, what about uh, stevia and erythroid? Okay, I, I talked about those. Uh, of the, any of the non-nutritive sweeteners, stevia and erythritol, by far the best. Edward K. O'Brien, thanks Dr. Brewer for very informative blood panel and CIMT review and consult yesterday. Well, thank you for sharing that via laptop video. Highly recommend folks. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. O'Brien, Ed. Um, one of the major things that I continue to run into is that people just can't wrap their head around. I can actually see a doc um, through remote means. The, they can get comfortable with doing other things remotely, but uh, they really have a challenge with this. Thank you again so much for sharing that. Peggy Johnson, thank you so much, doctor. Ken Patu, good morning, Ken Patu. My morning fasting blood glucose is 105, um, but my midday is lower, uh, 80s, and postprandial is well controlled, 130 at peak. Returns to 80s within two hours. What does this imply? Uh, Ken, for our, um, our, uh, events like we're, we're having the boot camp event we had a couple more people register for the boot camp event in louisville uh past couple of days by the way and at any of these events we'll start the mornings with uh, morning uh blood sugar testing you know just finger stick testing this time i'm bringing a couple of um uh insulin buttons uh or not insulin buttons uh re libre buttons free freestyle libre buttons which we'll hand out. We've done that a couple of times in the past. That's very popular as well. We will typically see 10 to 20% of attendees will have what's called the dawn effect. And that's what you're describing there where you have a high blood sugar fasting in the morning uh, but it drops after eating. You know, most people think it's going to be low coming in and then I'm going to eat something, eat breakfast, and it's going to go up. Again, with 10 to 20% of us, that's not what happens. We come in high, 
we eat something and it goes low. Now, what causes that? It's called the dawn effect, D-A-W-N. Dawn is the time of day, dawn. And it's got to do with cortisol. Um, we have what's called a, a diurnal or a, a circadian, just like everything else in our body uh, in terms of metabolism, we have a, a circadian uh, pattern for cortisol. Cortisol is like a long acting version of epinephrine. It's made by the adrenal glands. It causes our blood sugar to go up. It, it, like epinephrine, it's sort of fight or flight. It gets the human body ready for action. And about three to seven o'clock each morning, almost all humans have an increase in our cortisol level. That is what leads to the higher fasting blood sugar and then for those people who actually drop their blood sugar after they eat, what's going on there is um, they, they get an insulin uh, response to their, to their breakfast. And then that insulin response uh, causes them to drop their blood sugar. Great, uh, great question, Ken Patu. Um, thank you for raising it. Again, looks very much like classic Dawn effect. Now, um, <clears throat> A lot of people get really concerned about uh, when they have the dawn effect. I can tell you, I think there's maybe a little bit more, uh, uh, more heat than light, more emotion than is probably warranted. Yes, I, you should pay attention when you have dawn effect, but here's the thing. When you're looking at burning your glycocalyx, um, you're looking at having blood sugars of 140 and above for hour after hour after hour each day. Uh, most people that have um, dawn effect never get over, like you, Ken, uh, Ken Patu. They get in the high 90s, 105, 110, something like that. And then usually after the, their first meal, it drops back down. So I don't really think you're getting a lot of damage to your art, glycocalyx in your arteries from a from a dawn effect. If somebody does know that, if you've seen any scientific evidence that you do, I'd be very interested to see it because I just don't. Okay, Rob T07. Doc, I asked my GP about testing for myeloperoxidase and, LP and plaque two, and the tests weren't even available to order. I asked a specialist who didn't have them either. CRP was okay. Well, Rob, uh, thank you again for raising that issue. That's why I raised, uh, that's why I covered again what I covered today. Uh, we're, that's the purpose for what we've been calling the webinar uh, series. It's a, it's a uh, cardiovascular inflammation uh, test panel series is what it is. And that's exactly, again, why we're making that available. Uh, just a, another com comment on the story there. What happened was, uh, we do everything we can to make, uh, to do patient directed care, make, make medicine uh, available to patients. Sometimes that forces patients to think more than they want to. But again, if you're not, if you're one of these people that just wants to walk in, spend seven minutes with the doc, the doc tells you what they think you ought to do and then you walk out and do it. This is, you're not gonna spend much time on this channel. Uh, the folks that, that watch this channel, think about this, get into the details and want to start doing some of this themselves. Um, and so we were telling people how to get inflammation panels. Uh, it was self-directed care. We aired a, uh, a video on how to do that, I guess about three or four months ago. And um, it was an old video. It was something that uh, was in the cardiovascular inflammation course. And, um, we started getting feedback. People got very interested and excited about it. They went to Quest and they found out Quest is no longer offering the uh, inflammation panel to, uh, to direct patient. So again, that's why we're doing it with the, uh, the webinar series. And um, like I said, I'm obviously not the greatest marketer. I would have thought to call it something else. Peggy Johnson, what should I do about my gut biome then? Well, uh, it's a good question. A couple of comments. One of the most important things you can do is eat a, a, um, 
a probiotic or a uh, probiotic type food like sauerkraut, kimchi. Um, I, I hesitate. I don't ever recommend yogurt to people because even the yogurt that hasn't had tons of sugar added usually still has significant sugar. I personally supplement with uh, supplemental probiotics and I eat um, sauerkraut. I don't like kimchi. Um, and I used to try, um, oh, what was that? It was a sort of a liquid yogurt thing made in Russia. I used to do that, but it had too many carbs as well. But I will do uh, uh, supplements that I purchase that have um, uh, probiotics in it. And um, I'll eat sauerkraut about, I eat at least one or two servings of sauerkraut a day. So that's a much higher frequency of sauerkraut. And why do I do all that? Again, I'm looking out for my gut biome. I still do take some, uh, some non-nutritive sweeteners. So that's one of the places where I worry about that maybe the damage that those, uh, some of those diet soft drinks occasionally make on, uh, on my gut biome. And that's why I push the, uh, the probiotics. Eric Jantz, Dr. Brewer, do you believe atherosclerosis can develop for people that are very insulin sensitive, are not insulin resistant and do not have hypercholesterolemia? With these people, what could be the cause? You know, it's very interesting, Eric. I uh, actually see that quite often in my patient population. And it's like, you know, they get a good OGTT, good um, insulin numbers, and it's like, but they have plaque. And in fact, I've got more patients than not having that these days. And guess where that's coming from? My next question is, okay, did you lose 30 pounds sometime over the over the past? And the answer is always, yes, I did. So what happens is people uh, lose control of their lifestyle. They gain way too much weight. They know it. That added body fat mass drives insulin resistance. Um, they find out like they'll have, you know, they'll get a motivator like a family member will die from a heart attack or uh, they'll get a positive calcium score and they'll say, you know what? I've got to get focused. They'll lose 30 pounds and they'll then come to see me and I'll say, look, you've lost 30 pounds. You've, you're back to where you need to be. You're not insulin resistant at this point. Uh, what can I do for you? And they always say the same thing. Yeah, I've lost 30 pounds, but um, there's still a lot more I can do and I want to continue to dial it in. And I just wanted some consultation on that. And that's my favorite kind of patient to see. That's about 80% of my patients now. Uh, one of the patients I saw last week uh, had lost 100 pounds and knew he had about 30 more to go. And I actually suspect that he had a little bit more than 30 to go. But uh, what I usually, we're often unrealistic regarding how much weight we need to lose, um, but that's okay. There's a thing called the jump test. You take your shirt off and you jump in front of a mirror and everything that bounces is fat. So once you get down, you lose that 30 pounds. I tell them to go ahead and do the jump test. And typically, uh, I almost without fail, they'll come back and they say, yeah, I still got some saddlebags. I need to lose a little bit more. 30 was not quite enough. Okay, Bart Robinson, enjoy listening to you as always. Thanks, Bart, I appreciate that. Um, Peggy Johnson, thanks again, you're the best. Thank you very much. Uh, Raymond Rogers, uh, we're gonna be cutting off in just a second, guys, unless, uh, unless we get some more questions in. We're trying to keep it significantly less than uh, an hour, um, preferably closer to half an hour to Im improve the, uh, the ability for people to do uptake on uh, looking at the uh, the reviews. Uh, Raymond Rogers, we'll take first round of Repatha today. LDL is 95 and had a stent put in a couple of weeks ago and the pacemaker. Thank you very much for sharing that, uh, Raymond. And good luck with your uh, Repatha, good luck with your LDL and good luck with your uh, stent and pacemaker. Peggy Johnson, wow, lots of sauerkraut, Lava, yeah. I hate sauerkraut. You know, you, you do something for, 
for 30 days and you sort of, excuse me, usually acquire a taste for it. I still hate sauerkraut. I still hate that uh, natto stuff. I put natto powder in that morning coffee as well. And it's just like, I don't think I'm ever gonna get a acquire a taste for those. Um, <clears throat> 147 degrees west, may crack slaw uh, to it up from kimchi, also nicer in the winter. May crack slaw. I don't know what crack slaw is. That's <laughs> That sounds like a good opportunity for a joke. Peggy Johnson, can you give the name of the best sauerkraut brand? No, I cannot. I just use, I'm cheap and Kro I, I've got a Kroger about a mile from me. And Kroger has this, uh, look, this is a no name brand and it's in a jar about that big. So I, I will stay stocked up on it. Obviously it's got its own uh, bacterial colonies in it. So storage is not gonna be a problem. Then uh, I have a container in my refrigerator and I'll just open that container. When I, get, when I finish that container, I'll go to the, to the, uh, uh, the cupboard, take the jar, uh, open the jar up and fill up that container again for more sauerkraut. And again, it's, it's a no name. If anybody has a recommendation on brand of sauerkraut, I'd be very open to it. And if you find a brand of sauerkraut that actually tastes good, that would be wonderful. Uh, Raymond Rogers, how should LDL get? Oh, how low should LDL get? That, that's a, I, I'm going to actually just take, um, Take a, uh, a whack at that LDL issue, how low should it get? And then we're gonna wrap up. Um, that's like so many things in, in science and healthcare and, and uh, heart attack and stroke prevention, that's being um, debated right now as well. There are folks that will say, well, here's the standard, let me start with the standards. Then I'll go to the guys that are on either end of the standard and then I'll give my view of it. So um, the standards used to be like 130, then down to 100 a few years ago. Then they said now it, the standard is you know 70 or below for LDL. There are um, there are people that would say nope. You know what we've done, and they're talking about the H. Uh, PCSK9 and inhibitors. The PCS, there's been three studies that have come out with the PCSK9 inhibitors, which dropped the, the LDL levels as low as into the 20s. They said they actually got improved risk going that low. Uh, there, uh, and they also said, look, we're very much aware of this impression in the literature that there's a lot of problems with um, having low LDL. Um, increased risk for senility, brain fog, et cetera. But we're not seeing it in the 20s. Just wanted to let you know. And I've reviewed those studies. That, even though they said that, that data is really weak. So that's the guys, that's the standards, the guys that uh, would say go low. And in fact, I've got a patient, I did a video on him. Um, he, uh, he wanted to go that lower route. Um, the, um, and if you're interested in looking it up, you can find it. It's, it says LDL of 29 and he's happy. Um, and I understand fully where he's coming from. Uh, he's got, you know, as you'll see, if you watch the video, he's got some extra risks and um, you gotta try to figure out what the, what the, uh, the science is actually saying. I, paste, I, I basically will give patients what I know about the science, consult with them on that tell them what I would do, and then they make their choices. That's the way medicine should be. Now, let, that's the lower end of the spectrum. There are people that would say higher is better. I can't remember the name. He's, uh, he's an, a cardiologist that I think is of uh, Indian descent that's doing a lot of stuff uh, and quoting a lot of research on the internet uh, indicating that higher LDL levels are better. I haven't gotten too deep into his, the science he's quoting. Um, but I will say that, yes, he's focusing on wanting to get it higher. And so I've told you the standards on LDL. 
the guys that are saying low, the guys that are saying hi, I'll give you my version. I don't think, think LDL matters nearly as much as we used to think. Uh, and here's the thing. I think once you start understanding that image and that mechanism that we described in the very beginning of the, um, of the discussion, it begins to make more sense. Look, if, you're, if you have burnt your glycocalyx, your glycocalyx is what's, uh, what keeps that LDL, that oxidized LDL from penetrating into the wall of the artery. And that's what plaque is. It's oxidized LDL. That's why all docs for 50 years or more have been focused on LDL. They, you look at plaque in people's arteries, people that have died of heart attack and stroke, you analyze it, it's LDL, oxidized LDL. So the thought was decrease that LDL concentration. Let me tell you, I've got, given what I do, you can imagine, I've got a lot of people that have familial hypercholesterolemia. And I've got several uh, videos on that as well. I can tell you what I see. I don't see significant risk. People are not having uh, huge numbers of heart attacks with most FH patients. I will say this though, a, uh, a heterozygous uh, patient, um, here's, well, let me just say this. Here's where the risk comes in. If they gain 30 pounds and start getting insulin resistant, if they hit, start hitting their 50s and 60s and start getting insulin resistant, they tend to have less, um, uh, less margin of safety than other folks. That's when they start having their heart attacks and strokes. Now, people that have what we call um, homozygous, in other words, they had a, a familial hypercholesterolemia gene from their mom and one from their dad, those folks do have um, heart attacks and strokes in their 20s. So LDL does matter. There's no question that it does matter. I think it matters so much less than, uh, than we've tended to think. Uh, and it's still programmed into the standards of medicine. I appreciate the, uh, the interest. We've gotten a lot of people in here today. And again, we're, um, yeah, Nadir Ali, thank you, uh, 147 deg degrees west. Nadir Ali is the uh, cardiologist that's out there that's talking about try to get your LDL up. Again, thank you very much for your interest today. Uh, we've had a lot of attendance um, and um, we'll be looking forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye.